Okay, so uh, I have you for two hours. And the main thing I'd like to cover today is sort of a broad but brief introduction to determinantal point processes, what they are, uh, some basic properties about them, and then really start to lean into some questions around determinantal point processes, especially sort of from the perspective of sort of discrete mathematics and from the perspective of machine learning and theoretical machine learning. So to start, well, I should probably tell you what is a determinantal point process. So in general, that was exactly, yes, I will. That is a reasonable thing to ask. Yes. So a point process is just a probability distribution on the subsets of some set. So a probability distribution on the power set. And for our purposes, sorry, I thought I heard you say something. For our purposes, this set is discrete, and we uh, usually think it's fine. Yeah. So, what is a determinantal point process. Well, this is just a point process where our subset probabilities are given by principal minors of some matrix. Yeah. So let me define the matrix A. We'll call it the kernel. And we say that a point process is a determinantal point process if it's random variable Y according to K satisfies the probability that any subset S appears in Y is equal to corresponding principal minor of K corresponding to S all S in our set. So the normal uh, no. So, so, give me a second. Yes, yes. Okay. So, what is this saying? Is this is saying I have a set, let's say, of n objects, and I get random samples from the set. My random samples are just subsets. And what this is telling us is that the probability that some specific items, let's say, one, three, and I, appear in my random subset is equal to the principal minor of K corresponding to indices one, two, and I. Okay. Now, for those of you who have seen determinant point processes a little bit before, perhaps this is slightly different than another definition you've seen. And let's talk about this. So. Post positive probability. Like yes, and you. That's a reasonable question to ask. What conditions are you asking? What conditions on K we need? Yes. So, of course, we need uh, these things to be probabilities. We also need certain sort of like inclusion properties. And so, for instance, uh, if I minus K is convertible. Uh, And uh, you can see that the condition that K is a kernel of a DPP is, uh, so K this is equivalent to asking that uh, K, what does K in 
verse is a uh, P0 matrix. And by P0 matrix, I just mean a uh, matrix with all principal minors, non negative. Okay, good. And uh, this will become sort of uh, more clear in probably like 10, 15 minutes. Okay. Now, Avi was asking about uh, normalization, and there's another sort of way in which you commonly see determinantal point processes defined or represented. And this is through something called an L ensemble. Okay. So, let's define this. So this is a, another point process where here we're going to associate a different matrix, same dimensions. This matrix L, where here we're giving actual probabilities of specific subsets occurring. So the probability that uh, Y a specific subset S. This is proportional to the principal minor of L on the uh, indices of S. Okay. And uh, and uh, it's it's sort of standard sort of uh, convention that the empty set. The determinant of this is one. Uh, out of curiosity, what uh, probability should be one? Oh, no, no, no. So I'm saying that, uh, so by convention, determinant. You can see that this is natural for a number of reasons. But uh, yeah. I said to her that you don't want the empty set to occur with probability one. Yes, so this is uh, proportional. Oh, proportional. Yes, 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 of course. Sorry. Proportional. Uh, just a quick question for you know people who know some matrix. Yeah. Uh, so how does this way I I'm familiar with different uh, ways of like different determinantal processes, like the, the ones that you see in random matrix theory, sign kernels and things like that, which you use for GOE statistics. Is, is this related or is it? No, this is exactly the same thing. But that, so it's the same thing, only you have um, an infinite dimensional matrix? So for those, you have what you have is you have sort of your eigenvalues are sort of these elements that are appearing. This uh, is infinite. And in fact, in that specific case, these are always uh, projection matrices because you always get sort of like a fixed number of eigenvalues. And these occur in terms of like intersection probabilities with like certain intervals. Although I have to warn you that I am not a random matrix theory person. And so my expertise is like very much sort of like leaves there. But what I know is like from like conversations like Alan is quite interesting through matrix theory. But uh, yeah, we will get to a point later where we'll talk about DPPs with a specific structure. So, you know, for instance, random matrices. The all of a fixed size, no. Yeah, you always have a fixed size, right? You always get a fixed number of eigenvalues. And so looking at determinant point processes in which this uh, subset S, or in fact, when we think about it here, this subset S, when it equals, you know, for let's say eigenvalues, you know, N, then you get something non-zero, but when this is not N, it always equals zero. And we'll leave that. And I will, I'm going to give some examples, though all my examples are going to be sort of discrete and not. In random matrix theory, I'll mention a couple early references though. Any more questions? 
So it said you're supported, like the size of the support is fixed if and only if the K is a projection matrix. Did you say that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Is it completely obvious? I see one side. Ah, uh, let me think of it easy. Okay, never mind. We will get there. Yeah, yeah perfect. We will get there. Okay. Uh, by the way, is it clear to anyone what the normalization here should be? Yeah. Sum over all options. Hmm? Sum over all options. Yeah, and what's the sum of all over all options? The permanent of i plus l. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So this is uh, actually cool. <coughs> Plus L, and uh, I will prove this in fact because, uh, well, this will be useful to show that this definition and that definition are actually the same almost all the time. So let me state a nice little uh, matrix theory fact. So any subset T, we have that if we sum over all subsets containing T, the sum of all these principal minors is equal to the determinant of L plus this matrix I of T bar. Just define I of A equals one and only So this is just a generalization of the specific result. And this proof is uh, pretty straightforward. It's uh, prove this a couple different ways. Induction is easiest, I think. So The idea is that when uh, you induct on the size of T, so when uh, as of T, everything this is uh, trivial, and then if you sort of suppose holds for uh, greater than K, and then some uh, arbitrary okay what you can do is you can expand, expand the row. yeah you just expand a row and where you go well I'll be sort of telling you the proof the idea is expand a row Oh, and you can use your inductive hypothesis. And there you go. Okay. So. Good. And using this result, we can show that, oh, you know what? I'm going to. <clears throat> You're back. Can I now move to other words? Yes. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to leave this up. Oops. Now, I'm just going to tell you that uh, these two things, these L ensembles and these determinant point processes, are actually the same. So, L ensemble. Is a determinant of point process. The kernel given by A equals L and L is by inverse, and this also happens to equal uh, minus. If 
So first of all, before we, I'll show you a brief proof of this, but uh, before we do, I want to go back to your question. This L is specifically this, uh, where is it? Specifically, this quantity here that we need to be a P0 matrix. So because these two things are the same when uh, I minus K is invertible, then to ask which sort of K can give you a DPP, well, it's just that when you think about actual probabilities of specific subsets, you want them all to be sort of between zero and one. And that just happens when you get a P0 matrix out of this. Okay? So that's when L is a P0 matrix. Okay? So maybe that makes a little bit more sense now. Line of the statement. Is it easy to recognize if a matrix is a P0 matrix? No, this is hard in general. Yeah, this is hard in general. Yeah, but uh, okay, when, so we'll see how much time we have at the end. But uh, the takeaway is that a lot of these problems is, are hard in the order of x. Well, a lot of these problems really require sort of things exponentially large in the order of x. But in special cases, you do get uh, nice polynomial things out. For instance, you know, you have, yeah. Is there some, some uh, simple case where let's say L is diagonal or something like this, or just, just they have an example in mind where it's, yeah, it's some, some very simple case that we can just. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, we can do a simple example right now. So, okay. So let's think about the, sorry if I'm going a, a little fast. Let's think about the uh, diagonal case, like you said. So if L is diagonal, or K is diagonal, what does that mean? It means that each of the entries are independent of each other, right? The probability that a certain entry appears in your element is independent of all others. So suppose you, know, you have L equals some diagonal matrix. I'll just call it D. Well, you can just write this as uh, I'll just write it in terms of its eigen decomposition. So you get some lambda i's. And I'll just order them based off how they appear in the diagonal. So here, if this is your L matrix, then the probability that uh, i appears here, well, this is just lambda i divided by how do you see that? Hmm? Yeah, so you can see this in two ways. One, you can look at this, or you can also look at this result here, because k is equal to here. To be positive eigenvalue? Uh, so you just need non negative. And you can see that if we have an eigenvalue equal to one, uh, for our matrix K, then we sort of can't define our L because what well, you can sort of see, you sort of need the determinant of I plus L to be kind of infinitely large and that's why it's, and we'll really dig into that later. So far, so good. Okay, so I, I was gonna show you a brief proof of this unless do we want to see a brief? Okay, you probably want to see a proof, so show it. I'm always happy to share proofs, and I'll make use of this uh, nice little matrix theorem I mentioned there. So, okay. 
ruts. So the idea is, why don't we just explicitly compute probability, assuming we have an L ensemble, that sum S is a subset of this random line. Okay. Well, by our L ensemble definition, we're just going to sum up over all subsets S of their principal minors, and the normalization stays the same. We're just summing over all S We're summing up over all S. So it's Y, of course, here. This is supposed to be the policy of a fixed S, so Sorry. it's not the. Uh, no, excuse me. Wow. Yes. For S. Fixed. So if S is fixed, what do you mean summing over all Y? It says sum is over all Y. The sum is over all Y. Yeah, Y fixed now. Well, before in the probability, it's a random variable. Now you sum over, over yeah. subsets. The Y on the left hand side is not the Y on the right hand side. Yeah. I think that's obvious. <laughs> on the left hand side, y is a random, a random variable on the left hand yeah. side and the sum on the right. Ah, I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think I'll call it T. And I'll call it T. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Apologies for the uh, abuse of notation. Yeah. So we have some fixed S, and we're looking at all random Y. So this probability for a random Y is just the sum over all T that Y can equal, where T contains S. Okay. Sum by this uh, theorem over here, we can write this easily as uh, the determinant of L plus I R. What is the bar? Oh, it's the uh, same bar here. It's just complement here. Bar. Sorry about that. A single determinant. So, okay, and now I'd like to substitute in my K. So I have this L times L plus I inverse equals K. So this is now the determinant of K. Inverse, okay. No, I don't want to do this. So what I'd like to do is use this identity I have up here to rewrite L times L plus I inverse as I minus L plus I inverse. And so this gives me the determinant inverse plus the identity. Take my identity over here. Take this difference, get minus I of S. The inverse. This identity matrix missing ones for elements of S. This just has a full identity matrix here. So far, so good. Oh, we're 
practically done, I argue, because now what I can do is I can now write this I of S bar is I of S. Okay. I just take out this I of S here and I just use there. And now, just by writing this in block notation, we're going to get our answer out. This is just the determinant. Because this is just the uh, things in block notation where this is S bar, S, S bar. What we're going to get is uh, K S S, K S S bar. The, the upper step, the IS bar minus ISK. Oh, okay. So this you can write as breaking this into two pieces. Oh, okay. That's good. So PPPs, L ensembles, more or less the same. Okay. Good. So that covers sort of the first part of this talk, definitions and L ensembles. Also, I would like to talk about some examples. Now that we've sort of Find them, see that we can define them in these two ways, sort of understand some basic things. I thought now would be a good time to show you some examples of where they sort of pop up. Uh, and the this is due, so this is due to uh, the uh, definition, I think, may go even earlier. I think the name L ensemble might have came from Borden in the like early 2000s, but the concept. Is much, much in DPPs. So, uh, uh, sorry, it's the same time theory. Yeah. 60s, random matrix theory. Uh, Dyson and other people. Yeah. And this, it's a plus there, right? In the IS bar plus IS K. In the... Oh, yes. Excuse me. Yes, that is Thanks. a plus. Thank you. Thank sorry you. about that. Good. So, examples of DPPs and these examples I can talk pretty sort of well about, set for random matrix theory, and used to someone else. Peter Sarnak actually knows quite a lot about this, <laughs> as well as everything else. So, so I can values matrix theory and some key references. Other interesting examples are these so-called loop-free chains. Probably the most well-known discrete example is sort of uniform spanning trees. Well, you are going to write down the matrices or just set us with this? 
I'm going to list them, then I'm going to talk about them, and I'm also going to go into a little bit of depth in a couple specific examples. Okay. Okay, so just before, isn't any PSD matrix give you an L ensemble? If that is PSD, yeah. Then yeah. It, yeah. Mm -hmm. so that's a sort of universal example, right? Yes, okay, this is a universal example, but uh, yes, this is true. Okay. Yeah. These are, I guess, they all have to be special cases because if you want all the terminants of minus to be positive, I don't think there's any other way, uh, are, at least not PSD. Uh, no, it, it, it can be. Yeah, like uh, for instance, it's a uh, okay. I don't want to butcher this matrix result, but there's a matrix result that uh, suppose you want. So all we ask is that it be p zero. So if you want a p zero matrix, it turns it's out okay. But for, if for all, all uh, this is L. Sorry, this is L. Oh, yeah. So if you want a p zero matrix, it turns out, and you can find this, I think in matrix analysis, perhaps by Horn and Johnson, or topics of matrix analysis, it turns out that uh, eigenvalues can lie sort of everywhere except some wedge here. And I think the wedge might be like pi over n or something. So you can have eigenvalues with uh, negative uh, real part, negative real part, and negative complex part. So. But if it's uh, 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 right. if it's yeah. 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 yeah oh if it's self adjoint yeah yeah yeah. Yeah. yeah so the story here okay. good, good. is that when uh, when things are self adjoint everything is easy but the thing that I want you to sort of take away is that mainly in machine learning the focus is on self adjoint initially there has been some work on things that are not self adjoint from a theoretical perspective in mathematics people sort of say, why do you only care about self-adjoint things? There's so much rich sort of things happening generally. And I'll show you that in that uh, this one, loop-free Markov chains, not self-adjoint. Uh, this one, descents and random sequences, generally not self-adjoint. And I'd like to just briefly touch on these three and not intersecting this one, but briefly maybe touch on uniform spanning trees because this is an example of a sort of a, a projection where you have a fixed word because a spanning tree always has a fixed number of edges. Okay. Now I am confused. In all this story, the metrics were real or complex? Good question. So I've been hiding this a little bit. So I would say there's pretty much no loss of generality for assuming there's sort of like real. Some of these things hold in greater generality. Yeah, but self adjoint and you don't want complex. No, if the matrix is real but not symmetric, then uh, you will have complex eigenvalues. Yes, yes, but uh, if one restricts to real matrices, one will not see self adjoint matrix in general. Symmetric. The matrix has complex entries. So when he says symmetric, I assumed you meant symmetric real. Symmetric real. Oh, I said real, and yeah. So then self-adjoint is the same as symmetric. Oh, and, uh, yeah, but, uh, this example, yeah, but you can you can look at sort of complex matrices, yes. and if the matrix is Hermitian, you also get very nice things out. Yes. Yeah. Hermitian also. So if you restrict to real, is there uniqueness up to taking the transpose? Uh, so we will get to that later. It turns out that this question is a very, very complicated one. So, ah, so the answer is no, I see. 
Well, <laughs> that wouldn't be very complicated. <laughs> yeah. Well, the answer is so, okay, we'll get to this later, but you all are sort of asking me questions about this talk in random places. So I'll just give answers in random places. The answer is that if your matrix is, let's say, real symmetric, then uh, the sort of set of kernels is just given by, uh, so you just take some kernel, it's just DKD where this is a diagonal involuntary matrix. So just a diagonal, each entry is just either, uh, it'd be plus one or whatever. And this obviously does not affect the determinant of any matrix. And it turns out that this exactly characterizes the set of kernels of some DPP. For, the, for, for the symmetric. real symmetric. And this is a result due to, uh, I think it's 2012, but 2011. Sorry, what is K? K is your kernel. So you have, so. So I, I think it's understand the state. Any, any other kernel that characterizes? Yeah, so one thing that we haven't touched on uh, yet. Uh, so is the uniqueness of the distribution. Yeah. Got it, got it. Okay. So we have some distribution. It's defined by some K, but in some sense, the K we're using to define it is not unique because the determinant is invariant under certain operations. And so, uh, yeah, Ronan's question was about, can you describe this set just by this? And he also mentioned transpose. So, so this is in the symmetric case. In the symmetric case. Non-symmetric case is even much more complicated. To so here, this is fairly simple. This paper is a complicated paper, I think, but the proof doesn't need to be so complicated. Uh, in the case where you don't just have symmetry, things break very quickly. And there's a very, very, very nice result. I think it's quite a nice result uh, due to um, Ronan, you can perhaps tell me how to pronounce this. Lowy, Lowy? You don't know. Is it, uh, where is he from? Uh, Israel. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't know. It doesn't look Israeli, no matter how I try to pronounce it. I see. Okay, and this is from, I think, 80s. Yep. And there was actually a, a string of papers, but his last paper said that if you have a matrix and it satisfies a certain rank condition, then you do get out that uh, just this. So if you have two matrices, K and K prime, where they share all the same principal minors, so i.e. they generate the same DPP, then in the symmetric case, K prime equals DKD for some involuntary diagonal matrix D. If they are uh, not symmetric, but K satisfies a certain rank condition, which I'll write down for you in a second, then you can show that uh, your other matrix K prime is either equal to dk d inverse for some arbitrary diagonal matrix d or dk transpose d inverse. And uh, the condition, something called here, h, we call it h L in decomposability. So, this condition just asks that the rank A S R is at least two for all S of order at least two and at most, uh, let's say, number of elements minus two. If your matrix satisfies this property, and also it's irreducible. It could satisfy this, but be reducible in some weird way, but I think you can, yeah. Uh, as long as it's irreducible and satisfies this property, then you get this nice result out. If you don't have this, then sort of very weird things start happening. Yeah. Is there any actual example of uh, 
might just of a point process that doesn't satisfy this and, and you actually get uh, you have like example of two matrices that generate the same point process and are not related by something like this yeah so let's think up a simple example uh, no, so another thing to give it to me just to, to know if, if I'll, a, yeah, I'll give it to you in words right now so Suppose I take a DPP, and suppose we aren't thinking about a symmetric kernel, but we're thinking about the distribution of symmetry, okay, with respect to the elements. So permutation invariant. Permutation invariant. Yeah. So now this uh, you can show that gen generally that this is really governed by sort of like only three parameters, and you'll also see that what you would expect is you would expect your kernel K to kind of look like something on the diagonal, some value here, maybe some value here, some value here. maybe it looks something like this. But uh, this matrix in general won't satisfy just those conditions because for instance, this rank condition is being broken here. So you will get sort of stranger things out of this. Yeah, also I can sort of, I can illustrate simply in a sort of discrete graphical sort of point of why this is happening. If you, all, it sounds like you all have been asking me questions about this before we got there. So sorry for erasing this, but I can give some intuition as to why things should go badly. So imagine I have a matrix and I'm gonna represent my matrix by a graph. And this graph just represents uh, where sort of edges represent sort of non-zero entries and well you'll sort of see what's going on so suppose i have a graph that's uh you have a cycle so this is some number of edges here some number of edges here we have an edge here have an edge here and then we have something like this okay. your graph you have uh, edge for each non-zero entry yeah, so vertices are uh, elements, edges correspond to non-zero entries. And just to give an intuitive idea, if we think about this graph where this is just a long path, this side is also a long path, and we have these four edges here. And now let's look at the determinant of this matrix. If this is rank one, like let's suppose here, it's such that uh, maybe, the entries of our matrix K are one, 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 one. Let me think for a second. Are, so here, all the entries are magnitude one. On this edge, off-diagonal entries are the same. They agree in sign. Here, they disagree in sign. On this one, they agree in sign. And on this one, they disagree. Sign, I think. And if you take the determinant of this whole thing, what you'll get is when you look at the permutations, they all actually just cancel out. It'll just get zero. Or so when they are both plus or all pluses. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a transposition. It changes the sign, and you get uh, the same thing minus. It doesn't matter. I mean, I mean, hold on. Why should this be true when they're all pluses? When all okay. the, the you know the computer the terminals are just two matching two cycle covers yeah. and uh, they have different signs because you made one transposition. No, but all the signs should be the same, right? Like if all these off diagonal entries. Are, yeah, but the, the terminal has a minus because of this split part. But they all have the same order. They don't you change the order. Oh, it doesn't matter. No, I mean, they all have the same length. Okay, we can talk about this off. Not an issue. The sign is a yeah, but it doesn't matter. Okay, no, no. you have an example. <laughs> yeah, there are examples like this where this breaks in specific cases. Yeah. 
So what breaks here? The fact that you get a determinant which is zero? You get a determinant that's zero that doesn't really pick up the fact that you actually have something going on. Because for instance, that property could make that whole sort of cycle not really be represented in determinants that you see. But now suppose another cycle goes through it. You know, you have you have issues because, well, that is a kernel of a DPP, but it has all these edges here that are doing nothing. And so like that's not being represented by these two properties. Because for instance, in that example, which I just erased, you have all this, you know, sort of uh, machinery, but you can think that this is pretty much equivalent to this whole cycle just not even really being there, which, <laughs> which cannot be represented through these basic operations. And that results from the fact that that little sort of uh, join I made, this is a uh, low rank. All right, but that's getting quite advanced. Sorry, we were bombarding you know, with uh, questions. No, no. <laughs> I, <don't>, okay. <laughs> I thought that was. I said no, no more questions. I said no, no more. I thought I thought that was like sorry, please continue. But yeah, no, go ahead. Is there a nice characterization of uh, you know the matrix being symmetric by looking at you know the process rather than the matrix? Nice property that. Not that I'm aware of. It seems non-trivial to me in one way in which I could convince you that it's non-trivial is that I claim that, uh, for instance, the following question is actually not so easy. Uh, I have a matrix. I let you query principal minors. And the cost is just you know order one or polynomial cost. And I ask you to tell me is my matrix a diagonal matrix? Or is my matrix uh, sort of have the same principal minors as a diagonal matrix? You're actually gonna have to query like uh, exponentially many subsets. And okay, a diagonal is symmetric, so. So recognition seems different. Okay. okay. Okay, uh, you had a question. No, I was thinking of a nice same example a bit before. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, I have, I have examples that I'm ready to uh, be, I'd like to give us I've never seen this before. Yeah, no, I'm very mysterious. I would like to give some examples. Are we ready for some examples? Okay, so let's start with uh, these loop-free Markov chains. Okay, so let's suppose we have some X and let's say it's uh, countable, but uh, infinite. And here we have some transition probability. Which is just given by uh, P. This property of loop free is just saying that uh, P is X, X is equal to zero. All greater than zero and so this is just saying that uh, your Markov chain starts somewhere. What I? Power. 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 Okay. There are no direct cycles in yeah, this yeah. one. Yeah. So exactly, you start somewhere. You never go back there with probability. Good. So one nice thing that you get out of this loop free property is you can think about this matrix. U, which is just a sum of powers of P. 
This converges. So what is this telling us? U of xy giving us probability that some trajectory that's starting at x goes through y. Is this not a finite set? No, no. So this is a uh, yeah. So countable, yeah, discrete but uh, infinite. If it was a finite set, this wouldn't be very interesting. Yeah, yeah. This wouldn't loop free wouldn't really make sense. Okay. So this Q encodes sort of probabilities of you know what your trajectory passes through. Okay. And so. If we take this transition probability and we also give some initial distribution on the uh, elements of X. So I define some uh, X. It's just some uh, probability measure. It's a sort of interesting result that the trajectories in this X are actually a DPP. And the kernel of the mean by subject for me. Yes. So if at any time you take all the vertices which your Markov chain has visited. That is DPP distributed. The, the these sets, yeah. These sets. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. Are you going to oh, are you gonna write this? Yeah. So if for you look at your x pi for every pi for every fixed pi, so you take some p, which corresponds to a Markov chain on some countable. Uh, X, because this is loop free, we can talk about this quantity Q, which talks about the probability that the trajectory starting at X goes through some other point. And now to talk about an actual sort of random walk, we need to endow this with, with some initial sort of probability distribution. So we know where do we start. For any fixed pi, and P, if we look at inclusion probability, so we you know, pick some elements and we say, what's the probability that these elements are in my trajectory? This is DPP. That's on an infinite set. On an infinite set. Yeah, on an infinite set. Yeah. But again, just note for sort of reasonable things, this uh, DPP is defined for all finite subsets. So we're asking questions about finite subsets. So. In particular, the restriction subset is the DPP. Yeah, okay. Yeah, exactly. So say that again. If you restrict to just look and get finite, like take the marginal onto the finite yeah, subset. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's true. That's another way of yeah, another way of saying this. Yeah. And the kernel, which I have to admit, I do not have a great intuition about, given as follows. I do have a better intuition for some of the examples that follow, but the interesting thing about this example. There's something, uh, it, it has to be a matrix. What is pi x? Uh, pi x is the probability. Yeah, yeah but this is supposed to be. Oh, oh sorry, yeah, it's the yeah. number. It's just an n. Yeah, so this is for entry. Yeah, 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 sorry. So this kernel entry xy is given by the probability that you start at x, which you should think sort of tells you, okay, automatically I'm sort of where I want to be. This is telling you somehow I get to X and this is saying that uh, I start at Y. So the second one is indexed by X or by Y? 
by x. By x. So y enters from the only. Yeah. But uh, you should imagine y also enters in the sense that you know you take a principal minor, and of course the opposite entry encodes the other information. Y. Okay, and the reason why I bring this example up and sort of break this out is because this is a fairly rich example, and you see that this is not symmetric in general. So, for, you know, so non-symmetry captures, you know, interesting. So is, is there any reason not to define it on a finite graph, on X finite? Well, when X is finite, you lose loop free. No, it's going to be a direct and a cyclic graph. But then you're going to have yeah. outgoing edges. Yeah, I mean, and have a cyclic path, a finite mm -hmm. path. Mm -hmm. what's, what's, what's the problem? It's not a DPP. Yeah, what do you do at the end of the path? Yeah, but the end at the end, end, don't you have an issue? Yeah, you have to go back. You have to leave every vertex with some program. Yeah, yeah, otherwise, this is not going to be equal to zero, right? Uh, you can stop the process when you reach a sink. Or... Yeah, you can define a sink. I mean, you can always it's define a sink. sink and imagine that it continued from there, just going on, you know, some path. So, yeah, and then just take the oh, part. Here. Well, no, so, okay, I understand. Yeah, so you, you need, uh, yeah, I say it has to be a stochastic matrix. So, yes. you, you can't have like something yeah. zero. Yeah, that's, but, that's, uh, but yes, you can sort of, you can, uh, Look at the marginal on some finite subset, and if it always sort of if it never repeats and then it leaves, then yeah. yeah. But then, in some sense, it's still the same example, but you're just looking at it. So if we look at this uh, kernel, what would it be if we take just take an infinite path? I mean, you just go right. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's probably simple. And it yes, starts at the left. You know, we start at the uh, source, and you know, we'll get intervals where mm -hmm. we go. I guess. Yeah, so then uh, that means this is zero everywhere except at your initial point. Uh, this Q is going to be uh, sort of ones, a shift. a shift everywhere, but then zeros there. And then this is going to be sort of very simple. So that would have sort of very simple formulation. Someone can feel free to work out. It seems like all finite sets would have uh, probability zero, right? No, all finite sets would have probability one. Oh, one. one. To be right. Right. Yeah, exactly. one. All finite sets one. would have probability one. one. Yeah. Yeah. All finite prefix sets would have probability one. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And so that means uh, yeah, you can just make it, uh, I think, just a diagonal matrix of all ones. Okay. It was just, yeah. Uh, how do you see that? See what? Can you write, can you write down Q in this case, in this simple case of just walking right on the lattice? So I did not get the diagonal matrix from this formula. I just got it from the simple thing that, okay, if you have- No, 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 no. that's why I'm trying to figure out. Oh, okay. I'm trying to understand the formula by I see. the example that we- You can leave it as exercise. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't do that. Okay, let's let's do it. <laughs> Let's see. So if we let's just suppose we're looking at natural numbers and uh, pi of zero is one. And let's just see what happens. And you only go right. OK, so what happens? So. Uh, our Q. Is. Only important. So if this is our pi, so p is the p is shift. Then our q is only important for q zero of y. Otherwise, it doesn't matter. And q zero of y is one. Why? Okay. So this means uh, pi q x equals one for all x. Okay, good. And q of y. Wait, is this good? And Q of Y X is zero 
I forgot all y. Okay, so now let's look at k s x. So q is to sign up on one to infinity. So if q is a upper triangular matrix yeah. whose diagonal is zero and everything on the upper triangular is ah, yes, yes, yes. So q of equals one for all less than, less than or equal to y, and then I guess we have that. Okay, so let's look at uh, so a of xy. Let's just say neither of these are zero. So the determinants of principle might already be one. Yeah. It's a triangle out of matrix. One's on the other. That's upper true, but I need to matter. sort of look at these things. Let me think. Okay, what's happening here? We have. Yeah, it's fine. It's, it's a matrix it's with higher. ones on the diagonal yeah. and the upper triangular part. Yeah. And the upper triangular part doesn't matter. Yes, okay, good. Good, that is true. We computed it, but also just by sort of looking at the sort of Markov chain, you can see that you just want the identity matrix. Is a kernel, but also an upper triangular matrix is also a kernel. Okay. So far, so good. Okay, good. Next, let's look at some other examples. Let's look at these uh, uniform spanning trees. Okay, so suppose you have some uh, finite uh, undirected graph, loopless. You have some graph G and our set X. Now just going to be the set of edges. And now we just want to sample spanning trees from this graph. It's connected uniformly at random. Okay. So the way we're going to do this is what we're going to do is we're going to orient the edges uh, of e. So we'll give each edge a direction. This is a sort of natural thing that you do in graph theory sometimes, and it doesn't really matter the way you want to orient it. Okay. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to define k of e e prime, where e is an edge going from x to y. I'm going to define this to equal the expected number of traversals of e prime in a random walk from x to y. You can also think about this in terms of uh, current. So you can simultaneously think about this type of problem as a situation where the edges of your graph have uh, unit conductance, and you uh, you put in one unit sort of current flow from y to x, and now you ask the question how much current is going through prime. So often, like in graph theory, this matrix K it's called a transfer current matrix. But uh, in this K is, uh, so, okay, this is a DPP. The K I defined is the actual K. But uh, one of the reasons why this example is interesting is because, well, how many edges does a spanning tree have? It always has the number of vertices minus one. So that means our DPP is always outputting 
a subset of some fixed size. And so here, this is a projection matrix, and this is actually a uh, orthogonal projection matrix. So. Write this span over versus V, where and V is just representing edges instant to V. So there should, should be the the Laplacian or I mean the adjacency matrix of this graph minus some vertex remove, like the Kirchhoff law for counting. Yeah. Spanning this. Yeah, it must be the projection. Yeah, you can represent it. Okay. Yes, that is true. I was. Can you please do that? <laughs> yeah. So one nice way you can represent this is just through looking at each vertex and looking at sort of the difference of this vertex and its neighbors and its. Features, so. So you can imagine this is just the span of a bunch of vertices, a bunch of uh, vectors, where each vector is sort of encoding the difference between your vector and its neighbors properly signed. Yeah, but that's uh, it's, it's not a full length matrix. You could, yeah, no, it's not full length matrix. But you could remove one vertex from it and then. Yes, of course. That would be. Yeah, this is clearly. To connect it, uh, there's a, a basic theorem in graph theory that if you have a graph and you want to count, the number of spanning trees in it, then you can look at the adjacency matrix. Um, the Laplacian, the Laplacian. You will put the degrees on the diagonal, so degrees on the diagonal minus the adjacency. Yeah. Yeah. On this graph, this would be a singular matrix. Just remove any on our some of the non singular matrix. The determinant of this matrix is the number of spanning trees. And this will come out to be the, I mean, basically the, if the image of this project. You need a sign? You need a plus minus? No. No, plus and it's PSD, I mean. Yeah. Mm. Kirchhoff's uh, matrix tree theorem, I think it's called. So this is another way to see this, another way to see what he's saying. You uh, look at this and sum up each of these vectors, it sums to zero. This is related to the Laplacian because uh, uh, let's say you have the Laplacian of a connected graph, well, it has one zero eigenvalue corresponding to the all ones vector. All right, but uh, this is an example where the CPP is giving you sort of a fixed number of uh, elements every time. Uh, in general, if you take a CPP and suppose you want a condition on it having a fixed number of elements, these are so called K DPPs, but in general, these are not determinative point processes. And you can see this by even a, uh, a simple example. Suppose you want to take a determinantal point process, which gives maybe, let's say, all, it gives all uh, subsets of order, some fixed order K, equal probability, so uniform over all subsets of order K. If you try to write this as a determinantal point process, you will run into problems very, very quickly, as long as K is not zero, one, almost everything, everything but one element or everything. And so sort of conditioning on sort of the number of elements you have is in general, you lose your determinant to point process property. 
So just the, another simple way of saying what you said is that if we want the uniform distribution on k subsets out of n, this is not a point positive. It's not a determinant point. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So what happens in this case? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I mean, in this yeah, case, no, it is. This, no, in this case, in this case. It, oh, but in this case, this is a projection. In this case. No, no, maybe it's, it's not all subsets. The spanning trees are not all subsets of the, you know, they are always of the same size, but they are not all, all sets subsets of edges of this size. So the, so the, yeah, so it's not uniform. Oh, no, 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 but, uh, no, 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 but it, it can be uniform, of course. No, I mean, uh, some subsets of uh, edges in, the, in any graph are not. Uh, you can take a clique. And then yes, also in a clique, you don't get all subsets being spanning. Ah, this is true. Let me think about this for a second. Anyway, once you once you take, take a, once you take a triangle. Yeah, take a. Uh, that's yeah, a one triangle. Has, that's too small. For <laughs> take a cycle. Then. No, no, no. Take a cycle. In the clique. You take a subset it's of right. size of yeah, the this will work. No, no, it's yeah. one less than the maximum. So I can then then you. you want K to be not to ah yeah, yeah. What I'm saying is that you can get uniform, but what you will get is one of those four examples. Yeah, I know. So ah, yeah. I'm saying in general, you don't get ah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> is there any other nitrate uh, whose basis are uh, um, yeah, the uniform distribution on its basis is that point positive, except for time three. Not that I know of often. Okay, and uh, so one other example of these uh, non intersecting random walks, which I'm not going to sort of write out for you, but I'll describe verbally. So if you have uh, K different random walks with a start vertex and end vertex fixed on, on a it's on let's say on a fixed uh, graph on uh, let's just say on the sort of uh, integers. Okay. Okay. So I have not read this paper fully, but I've seen explanations of this, and so I'll just lightly explain it, but know that I'm not prepared to sort of go in depth and. You're looking at random walks where each random walk starts at a vertex, ends at a vertex, and you condition on the fact that these random walks going simultaneously do not intersect. And they go for some amount of time. They do not intersect, you mean, at any particular point at in any time. At particular point in time, time, you find different, different uh, places, always, yes. Then I believe that if you look at the distribution of the location of those K random walks, at a fixed time, that is DPP distribution. Yeah. Okay. Good. And then uh, lastly, I'll sort of briefly touch on this uh, descents and random sequences, which is sort of a really simple example. The first one you also didn't do, right? Yeah. Okay. You're not going to do it. I'm not doing the first one. Yeah. But I wrote this because, well, I've already gotten questions. So I thought I'd just like mention, just point to some places. Yeah. But, uh, so these descents and random sequences are actually quite nice. So let's suppose you just have some uh, set A, which so we can just say is a subset of the natural numbers. Let's just say it's finite, make our lives easy. And suppose we just define a random sequence by just uh, randomly choosing elements from the set IID. So we just choose A1. And now what we want to do is we want to look at descents. So we want to look at places where a number is less than the number that came before. So let's define, uh, 
Sorry, A is it finite or infinite? Uh, finite. Yeah. So I'll define my Y. To be set I such that AI. Any reason not to no. think of A as the first no, no, so reason to. Uh, yeah, sure, you could think A is uh, one through M. One through M. Uh, it turns out that this set Y is DPP distributed, actually, which is sort of. Okay, the first time I saw this, it's a nice paper of uh, Borden, Diaconis, and Fullman. It's, uh, yeah, I, I was somewhat surprised, and they actually showed that sort of a very nice. So it's random, so you go to for a fixed length, you think? Yeah, I have a fixed length of length n plus one. And we're just looking at the elements which are less than the previous. So when you say, when, when people prove that something is DPP, do they actually provide K or do they, or is there some characterization of DPPs without talking about K? So in all the examples I've given you, they define it through K. They sort of show you some K and they say, hey, this is a determinant, either K or L. And uh, here, this is, DPP with kernel parameterized by some function little k minus x, where you can get these k's out from the following. Z, where this function R of Z encodes information about the number of consecutive, the pro probability of number of consecutive uh, sort of occurrences. So. So you can get this out through looking at this function r of z, where our coefficients are given by these rho of j, where rho of j is the probability that we have j consecutive descents. And here, uh, in this case, we also don't have symmetry in general. It's a, it's a complex matrix of some sort. Yes, exactly. It's simply parameterized yeah. by the difference in the matrix, which is, which is in some sense what you would expect given that uh, this DPP has this nice sort of shift invariance property. Right. So, so what, what is the formula on the left? So you're summing up. What, what, what does this give you? These KIs are these coefficients. So you're writing this as a polynomial and your KIs, the sort of, the values of your toplets matrix are the coefficients of powers of I is uh, Y minus X. Yeah, so you're taking this polynomial, which is encoding the probability of uh, consecutive ones. And then you're writing when you roll one minus this, converting it as and writing this, taking it series, 
and the coefficients of the series are giving you the values of the um, the, uh, the um, yeah. why can't I talk right now? Uh, what are those things called? The diagonals, the, off di the, the super diagonals and sub diagonals of your matrix. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so that's all I have for examples. Are we good on sort of, so so far we've done examples, we've done definitions, and we've done a smattering of questions of things to come. Are there any questions so far? Okay, good. So next, let me just list some basic properties of DPPs for you quickly, list them without proof, just to give you a sense of uh, some of the power of things you can do. Then I'll talk a little bit about sampling. I'll talk a little bit about computing the mode of a DPP. And then we'll see how much time we have, but I can talk about this question of recovery of a DPP and also sort of identifiability of the kernel, which is really where most of my research focuses on. But, Okay, so so let's look at some basic properties. So suppose you just have some y. Okay. Well, as we already mentioned, we can uh, restrict. So y intersect a for some arbitrary a. Will this still be p? Just in this case of a, yes, of course. Uh, you can show and this normalization. Don't you really like? No, because. When we're looking at a DPP, this kernel K is representing subset probabilities. It's not our L on self -over. So you have these two definitions, but largely I'm going to work with sort of the DPP definition of a sort of kernel rather than this L ensemble L. And this is largely because in many ways, this uh, K is more natural in a lot of settings. And also this L is not always defined. Yeah. And in fact, in a second, sort of make more explicit this concept of why L is not always defined besides just the sort of basic, you know, this thing is not invertible. So this definition I give you is no good. I'm going to give you sort of a, a sort of more intuitive reason why. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so perhaps somewhat counterintuitive, especially when your kernel is symmetric, uh, complements are also still DPPs. I say this might be counterintuitive because when you have a symmetric DPP, you think about it sort of representing some sort of diversity or some sort of negative association. How can set and its complement have negative association? But wait, this, wait, when you say symmetric, you mean the probability or the matrix? The matrix. If I say symmetric, I'm always referring to the kernel unless I specifically say a symmetric probability distribution. Because sort of a lot of the yeah, a lot of the specific intuition and a lot of the early use of this for machine learning is very much focused in on the symmetric case. Because when you have a symmetric kernel, you get this nice negative association. Everything is sort of trying to get away from each other. And you have a nice representation in terms of uh, thinking about volumes of vectors, which I'll touch on in a second. So what does complement mean? They're all defining it. Yeah, so thank you. <laughs> So uh, complement just means take this y and this is a DPP. And the other thing to keep in mind is uh, the question of what happens when you try to scale a DPP? How should you think about this? 
this. So, Kaylin, let's say we try to think about uh, some y prime. K, assuming C doesn't rule K inadmissible. So let's say C is uh, greater than zero and also not too large. Then uh, probability or subset probabilities. So the size of the subset. And you should think that this is sort of like saying, I want to take a uh, random Y from my original DPP, and then I want to sort of IID delete each element with probability like one minus C, assuming C is between zero and one in that case. Okay. okay good. And now let's talk a little bit about. Uh, the number of elements in our random set. Okay. So suppose distributed, and let's also assume the spectrum K is uh, real. That is going to be a negative. So let's just suppose we have real non-negative spectrum, then we can say something. So here, I'm not assuming symmetry. I wanna give you the most general result I can. Okay, then we can actually write this random variable y as the sum of uh, nodes with uh, Success probability for each eigenvalue of K. We want to think, or well, that's a theorem, but that's a. Uh, no, it's not think. This is true. This is. That's why I'm asking. This is a theorem. Yes. Yeah. This is a theorem. Yes. So this is. And this sort of simple idea already tells us why L ensembles don't always make sense. So just a second. I mean, we can, I guess it's easy to see in the diagonal case, the small vertical definition. Why is it true in general? Is there a okay. simple to see? Oh, you don't have to see it. I just wonder. So in the symmetric case, I would say it's uh, it's not too hard to see. I would say it would take, it takes about two pages of work. Okay. And, and uh, it's not like an intuitive clear reason why it's too painless will convince us. So the intuitive way you can think about this is you can always think about a determinantal point process. It looks like a min-max. Uh, it, it looks like it should it should come in, in a way from a min-max because you're you're looking at all. At absolute value of y. Uh, absolute value is just the size of this set. Yeah, and now we are asking about all sets that contain a set of size k. If you're, if you're asking about all sets that contain a size k, in a way you're, you're uh, and you're looking at all the minors. That's, Oh, never mind. Uh, the most intuitive way that I've seen of this, though there are probably more intuitive ways, is that when you look at it for the case of symmetric matrices, you can think about your DPP as, in some sense, a sum of these so called elementary DPPs, in which you allow only uh, eigenvalues to be plus one or zero and weight these. And when you show that you can represent any DPP as some of these, it becomes a little more natural. And this will actually be sort of a key ingredient of a very nice sampling algorithm, which I will show you time 
well, certainly time permitting. But somehow you are telling me that if I have a PSD matrix and we find the which is a, my kernel is a PSD matrix. Your kernel that, is uh let's say it's a PSD matrix. That's a symmetric case, and uh, yeah, and you are telling me the size of y is you know it doesn't change if I if I do a you know even a total basis change if I just contribute with any any matrix. If I turn basis, it's the same. At least if we look at this one of my other, the size of y is independent of the yes. uh, change of basis, which I don't see, but the apparently is cool. Yes, although I do want to mention that uh, we can't take any PSD matrix. But yeah, if you properly scale, then good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure. exactly. You take any PSD matrix for L, and you can properly. Yeah, exactly. Okay, good. Uh, so one thing that this is telling you is this is telling you why uh, sort of inherently. If k has an eigenvalue equal to one, why thinking about L is somehow not sort of does not fully make sense. And that's because if one of these eigenvalues are one, then that means we never get the empty set. Okay? Because y is, you know, you're always getting something out. If you never get the empty set, and somehow this definition for an L ensemble doesn't make sense because this point of I plus L has to be infinitely large. Okay, so just know that that's the little thing hiding behind this I minus K being to be invertible. Here can K be complex matrix and self adjoint? Uh, yes, this should work. This should work as long as it's still, yeah, all I need is this property. Good. So uh, one nice thing is that uh, the distribution of this, this uh, the PDF, this is something called a Fourier frequency function, which is just saying that uh, this is a uh, long concave. So one nice thing you get out is that this distribution is a unimodal, and you also have this property that uh, the mean and the mode are within one of each other. And sort of being able to say all these results in this specific setting, this corresponds to uh, this uh, a generating function associated to this having all real zeros is sort of the reason why this condition is here. But in this metric case, these things are even easier. I do not know. So I know in the specific case of some metric, I'll tell you who it's due to. It shows up in a nice survey on DPP by. Uh, uh, Yuval Perez and some other people. So if uh, you look at symmetric, I know this shows up in uh, And they actually do something quite nice in that paper, which is they give you a sort of very nice sampling algorithm for uh, symmetric DPPs, which I'll show you in a second. Once I just show one more uh, basic property, and then I'll show you this uh, sampling algorithm. Then I'll briefly talk about this mode stuff, and then. I can sort of briefly sketch a landscape of this sort of recovery learning question, and then I think we'll be out of time. Okay. All right.
Okay, so last sort of basic property I just want to briefly mention, I'll mention this with more or less without proof is uh, questions of conditioning. So suppose you want to look at the probability that your random variable y equals uh, some subset b conditional on the fact that is, uh, it's disjoint from a. So you can write simply as the determinant of b divided by a bar. And this conditional probability is still a DPP. And I think it's pretty straightforward to see. And this is uh, with uh, So from this, you see immediately the repulsion property if you have symmetric. Yeah, exactly. You, you yeah. see that you have. Ah, yeah. Okay. No, the negative association. Yeah, negative association. Yeah, you also see negative association when it's symmetric. You can always write L as like B transpose B. And uh, then you can write your determinant as the volume squared of uh, sort of columns of B. And then you can also see this sort of negative association because you can think of these columns of B as like lying in some space and the determinant is just the volume. I mean, the determinant is just the volume squared of the parallel pipe generated by those. So yeah. how the repulsion of what? But what's how do you see repulsion? Okay, let me if I tell you that something is yeah, in sorry. the set, then any other thing, the probability that it's still in the set I'll any show you a probability <laughs> that it's in the set decrease. Like here, I I'll show this to you in a straightforward way. Okay. So let's just suppose we have a symmetric. Yeah. So we have uh, let's say transpose. Okay, so we have in this case it's just like in the diagonal case, the example I gave before, but slightly more general, if L has a eigen decomposition with the lambda i as our eigenvalues and B i as our eigenvectors, uh, normal eigenvectors, then uh, you see that our k this, I'm just gonna write this so I have this for later. You can write L as B transpose B for some matrix B, right? Yeah. And yeah, let's just say. And here, now let's write this probability again. This probability that Y equals this. This is just, oh, here, let me proportional. This is proportional to of LS, right? This is equal to the volume squared of the columns of BI. It's an S. So they feel you get a very nice volume interpretation. Columns of the I I in S meaning take the take the take the the columns that correspond to S and construct that parallel pattern. Okay. Volumes of the two eyes, just the first. Then you see their repulsion. So, so again, what, what's the repulsion? The volume of a parallel 
byte is always less than the volume of the corresponding box with the same edge size. And the truth actually tells you that you will have like this negative uh, or generalized negative correlation, whatever you call it. And this is why, uh, yeah, I said negative association. This is why sort of symmetric DPPs are sort of interesting machine learning in a lot of examples for things where diversity is important. Propulsion. So in things like document and timeline summarization, where maybe you want to return a diverse set of objects. Uh, there's, a, there's an interesting uh, experimental paper. I remember it was kind of cool. And I, uh, I had a newborn at the time, so it was a uh, registry for baby uh, gifts for family. And the idea is that uh, they actually use this in practice as a way, in the specific example, as a way of being able to tell what item you should buy the couple and what item you should. So imagine, you know, you're a couple, you put a bunch of items on an Amazon registry. Maybe you have a crib, maybe you have, uh, you know, a sort of noise machine, but maybe you have a crib that is a crib and a noise machine together. And the idea is that uh, you represent this by a DPP and then you rate items that have not yet been bought by someone for the couple based off how sort of uh, likely that item being added to the set that people already bought for them would appear. And in some sense, the diversity would tell you that suppose someone already bought them the crib plus noise machine, it would tell you, well, don't buy the noise machine because they already have crib plus noise machine and don't buy the crib, but go buy them the milk heater because they don't have that yet. And so it's trying to find things that are unrelated. Things that are unrelated are very likely to appear, by unrelated, I mean orthogonal, but things that are very related are very unlikely to appear together because the volume of that parallel pipe would be so small. Yeah. And so that's originally why you know people liked it in machine learning. Okay, good. Uh, the other conditioning that you can do, and this I have to say is quite non-trivial to see, but I'm just going to sort of list it as a property, but I should state that this is uh, in some sense, not the easiest thing to do, but uh, well, the easiest thing to show that this is true, in my opinion. So suppose you want to condition on the fact that some fixed set of elements are already sort of appearing in your random sample, and you want to see the probability that the rest of the sample equals a specific set of items. Well, this, a determinant of L and A union B determinant of L. It is completely non-obvious, but I will say that this is also still a DPP. And I want to stress that what the kernel is, is actually not so obvious and it's a little messy to write, but this is also still a DPP just to sort of see a little bit of the power. But if it's all right with you, I'd like to, with the last like 15 minutes I have, I'd like to briefly write a sampling algorithm. I will not really go through a proof of it or talk about elementary DPPs, but I'll do this, briefly talk about computing the mode of a DPP, and then maybe open it up to a discussion about some of the later questions, which we've already actually talked quite a bit about. Okay. Okay, so this is a sampling algorithm for no, sample. No. Semi, uh, semi yeah, okay, good. Yeah, okay. So now I just want to briefly describe a really interesting sampling algorithm. So 
when we have a symmetric kernel, which is related to this uh, observation of these uh, sort of this magnitude of y being a sum of order loops. Okay. So what we can do is step one, just compute how many elements are in y. So you step one. Do is we're just going to define some J subset one here. Okay. Where this is uh, again ID Bernoulli with uh, probability. Okay, if we're using this board here, then it's uh, Oh, we sampling. What do we want to sample? Uh, we're sampling a subset of one to n. And this is supposed to have the probability because k, when you define k for the probability that the set is inside somewhere. Yes. So here you are talking about something. So here I'm sampling y. So, so you want, so it's like you're sampling from L. I'm sampling from, yeah, or I'm sampling from, yeah, I'm sampling from L or I'm sampling from. Sure. And the first step is I'm just asking the question of what subspaces, what subspace do I want active? So this is me saying which eigenvalues are active in some sense. Okay. So don't think about this as being at all related to Y. The first thing I'm doing is I'm just saying how many elements will Y have? And which eigenvalues correspond to the elements in some sense. And then the next step is sampled from the projection to that subspace. Yes, exactly. And it's only two steps. And we just keep sampling and sort of orthogonalizing, sampling, orthogonalizing until we end up with nothing. And that's the algorithm. So two. and let me also define uh, my set V to just be the I's where I is in J, and then I'll just initialize my Y to be empty. Okay. And so what I'm going to do is while while V is not empty. All I'm going to do is I'm going to choose um, in my uh, set. The probability is going to correspond to uh, the projection on the DI. So. Probability of A to B is the sum of the probability of the. J is really in J in capital J, not in X. J is in X. So I want to sort of go over this again. Capital J is a subset of the eigenvectors. It has nothing to do with the coordinates. Yes. So J. The game we're playing here is we're choosing the eigenvalues we want active. This is unrelated to y, yeah, in some sense. So that's why I'm using these indices for j, and I want to use x for these to show that they're different, even though you could think of x. x has an object, so you could think of it as the same, but I want to stress that they're different. Okay. Okay, so we choose some with this probability, and then we just uh, put it in y. And now all we do is we replace V with some sort of orthogonal projection where we just have an orthogonal basis. We're at V orthogonal to uh, And okay, 
it's not as simple as just like cutting out things and making them zero because it's not orthogonal anymore. So. V orthogonal to EI, what is I? Oh, sorry, E or J, excuse me. Yes. Can you repeat the last, what, what? So what we're going with? The, the Y union J L Y. So what are we doing? We're choosing some J from, from X. From X with probability corresponding to the projection onto EJ. We choose it, we add it to Y. And now what I want to do is I want to make sure that now my V, my new V, is orthogonal to EJ so that it never shows up again. And so I orthogonalize this, the space spanned by the columns in V, the elements of V. Then I compute an orthonormal basis for this. But, but what did you do to Y? I'm not sure. I, I oh, I just added J to Y. You just added J to Y. Yeah, I just, just added J. I said, okay, I chose J. Now it's one of my elements. I see. Yeah. And now you're. Now you're and then I just repeat. Make your your uh, projection again once you remove the once you remove the J's uh, linear subspace and. I just keep going until V is empty. Until V, you know, has you know, empty space. But what, what did you do with the probability of J? The probability of J becomes zero if I've already chosen J. No, but not, once you chose J, what, what did you do with it? Well, I just keep using it to keep sampling elements. It helps me to think of a J by N matrix. This is a, yeah, you already picked your J, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a J by N matrix. Uh, the, the rows in this matrix are length and they are on the initially orthogonal. Yes. Right. Now you pick some coordinate, some column, mm -hmm. which is your first J. Mm -hmm. You want to remove it yes. and you want the rest of the vector, which is now length N minus one, to be. Orthogonal. They are not orthogonal. Right, you have to you know, you take an orthogonal uh, basis of the same space, mm -hmm. and you repeat. Yes. Okay. And you do it until the you know, day becomes zero. Yeah. And in the end, this is actually a uh, sample uniform from this DVP. Right, so if you sample columns according to their norm. In this matrix, yes, exactly. The 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 problems, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. Exactly. Is this really a silly question, but uh, like in this procedure, can you say that the set you get is of size j or that second? Yes, it's of size j. Yeah. Yes. So step one is saying how big is this going to be? Also, which eigenvalues are active? The ones that aren't active, you can pretend they just aren't even there. So each like is removing EJ should reduce the like b to by one each step. Like, uh, yeah. it, it, it gives you the number of steps. Yeah, yeah. You started with a projection whose, whose dimension is J, mm -hmm. is capital J. It's that you remove it, you know, eventually you will get a set of size. Right. So with my last five minutes, so first of all, you can find a proof of this. And so this was first proved So this is simultaneously a very nice uh, review paper on DPPs, but you can also find the, uh, this is the first place that this was proven. So this is quite a nice result. And uh, one thing which I wanted to mention somewhat in passing, this is not something I've done research on, but this is something that uh, remains an interesting question. Okay, he's there, so good is uh, computing the uh, mode of the DPP. Well, equivalently, you can think you have a matrix. What's the largest principal minor? So the principal minors here are actually um, log submodular. So uh, Uh, what's the definition of mode? 
uh, the most likely to occur. So uh, PL is uh, submodular. But uh, it's not monotone. And so the question of trying to compute the mode of a DPP, or in general, trying to compute the largest principal minor for matrix, this is hard. This was shown to be hard by uh, so. Uh, this was shown to be hard by. But uh, what I want to focus hard, on. Hard, you mean NP hard? What do you mean? Yes, NP hard. But uh, I want to focus on that is actually NP hard up to. Uh, Approximation factor of uh, eight ninths plus epsilon, and this was more recently. And the idea is uh, to use exact cover by three sets. And the idea is you can sort of. Uh, construct this matrix L as a sort of B transpose times B, where the columns of B encode information about uh, your uh, three element subsets of your set S. And so there's a, a big gap here between this sort of constant and approximability result and sort of approximation algorithms you can get. So if, this was uh, some modular and monotone, then there are some sort of nice results and guarantees you can get. But without monotone, things are like not quite there yet. And uh, Kaliza and Taskar, and also um, Taskar and Gillenwater had a nice paper where they uh, treated this specific case and they got a bound of, uh, I think, one over log n for specific examples of uh, your L ensemble, where the smallest principal minor, I believe, has to be at least one. So you're going to give us an approximation algorithm for the mode? No. No, so what uh, you say, it's hard to compute the mode, and yeah. it's even hard to approximate it to some factor, but so what are the best approximations? Yeah so, what I, so this, yeah, okay. yeah, so what I was just saying is you get, uh, so this, here, I'll even write the paper out so you can take a look. Uh, it's, uh, I'll give you two references. So, uh, Gillenwater. Oscar. Laser. 12. This is not an approximation algorithm in a general sense and that it only works for certain Ls. So this works for L, I believe their condition was the smallest principal minor has to be at least one, which, okay, when you're working with L, sort of the scaling actually really affects your DPP. So this is, this is a decently strong condition that they require. And in that uh, regime, I think they get a one over log n approximation. A uh, more recent work of Singh uh, 15, which I'm somewhat less familiar with. They get uh, one over e to the r, I think, plus little o of r approximation for an optimal that they produce if the optimal they produce is. Uh, like they get this approximation for any comparing their solution to anything that is of length r. Right. So if uh, rank r, yeah, sorry, rank r. But uh, this is still quite quite far away, and so so, so an interesting so a really interesting question would be: uh, Is there a constant? Approximation algorithm for this is there even you know let's say uh, you know one over log at one over poly log. Yeah, so you said the model of the DPP you're talking about. Say, so what's an approximation? I said how many elements you have? 
the good note. Uh, so by approximation, I mean in terms of magnitude. So like if you so for instance, you would want some sort of guarantee, like uh, I produce some uh, some S such that the determinant of all of S is greater than or equal to alpha times the maximum over I'm telling you that alpha is uh, greater than epsilon, then this is actually a hard problem. Well, a hard problem. Both the upper bound and the constructions, do you assume that what you get is a DPP? So for the uh, for this specific result of Gil, Water, Tasker, and Kaleza, you specifically assume you have a DPP. The second result, I think, holds more generally, decently more generally, but uh, I generally think of this paper as sort of saying the nicest thing for the specific case. And the, the hardness originally was not shown specifically for a DPP, but it was just asking the question of the largest principal minor of a matrix. Because you said it, but the construction is a PSD matrix, and so okay. you know your L. It's just your L. So yeah, because you said it just uh, checking if something is a DPP uh, is difficult, right? But not uh, when you're dealing with something symmetric. Okay. Yes. What's the motivation to for finding the largest principal minor? Does it have applications? And in... well, suppose just like the baby example I gave you. Well, and, maybe you, I guess you want to estimate, know the probabilities, but finding the ah the largest is like the first recommendation to give. Yeah, like the most. Yeah, the best, like the best, if the best you, sort of like the best gift. If you could buy them, yeah. yeah, if you could buy them, sort of like what's the or in some sense the most like everything, just the full set. Well, then you get like things are you're getting things they don't need in some sense because things are getting redundant. Yeah. They might not even like that. So. But okay, this is sort of a, this is a question that has gotten some traction and some uh, there's some literature around there. This is not something I actively work on, but I thought I would mention it. I'm starting to get a bit of, uh, over on time, so I think I'll stop here. But uh, I, if you all want to sort of talk to me about these things specifically about some of the questions that we have, that people had earlier around sort of uh, recovery identifiability, uh, feel free to chat with me about this and I'm also so, so we do the first thank you and then we have <laughs>
delta, which delta you can compute with the means of that. So maybe can I ask a question about like the so the recovery in the sense that I give you uh, I, I give you samples to cover the matrix. So there's I guess if it's symmetric, one obvious thing to do is just to look at all pairs. And then if you look for every pair, you have the two probabilities and the correlation, and that gives you the corresponding diagonal and off diagonals, right? Is there something more sophisticated than that? Yeah, so that actually doesn't really give you everything. And so you, for the symmetric case, you get sort of almost everything but you're really missing high order interactions. And in the symmetric case, it actually becomes a really beautiful graphical problem. But, but if you know that it's a determined DPP, yeah. then obviously like this, this is all you need. Just no, 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 no. Because you get these sort of, you get the magnitudes, but you don't understand anything about signs, which ah, cover ah, high order interactions. Yeah. Ah, wow, okay. Yeah, yeah. And it becomes a rich graph theory problem actually. Okay. Okay. Signs of what? Of the signs of off diagonal yes. entries. Ah, wow. Yeah, and what you get is actually so, really so beautiful. So you can, know, you can think just about the spanning wheel, and uh, you know, I give you a bunch of problems, right? so you should guess what the graph is. It's not obvious that just from the pairs, it will be able to. I give you some n to the 10 entries of some graph you don't know. But, uh, you know, we should recover the graph. Well, even by the way, it's not clear to me whether this works or not. But it's, 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 oh, that, that is probably not difficult, right? Yeah. Uh, it's it's the union. Yes. No, no, the union is not enough. I mean, why should it be the union? Yeah, if you took enough, yeah, I mean, you wouldn't be able, out of samples, you wouldn't be able to do more than the Titan edge you didn't see. I know. So the question how close to the force it is, yeah, you can take the union. Maybe you should ask like to recover the weights. Maybe that's more like a, because if you just have a graph, then as or says. But if you have weights, then okay, yeah. But if you look at the distribution, you get by DPT. Is it closed? The set of all possible distributions. It's a good question. I don't know. I've never thought about that. I have a question about this Louis I think, result. Yes. Oh, sorry, I'm thinking about. No, no go ahead. Your question. No, just uh, this characterization in the non symmetric case mm -hmm. of the uniqueness or non uniqueness. Yeah. I mean, suppose it's just an upper triangular matrix. Yeah. Right, this real matrix, which is not symmetric, it's really upper triangular. Then, you know, everything is determined. The determinants are determined by the diagonal. The off diagonal don't matter, right? For, for mm -hmm. And they don't, you know, different. If I put different things on the upper triangular part, then it doesn't affect the probabilities, but it doesn't look like. But it's not irreducible. It's not this HL irreducible. Oh, it's yeah. not irreducible. Good, very good. Yeah, got it. Now I understand this condition. Very good. Okay. Yeah, yeah thanks. No questions. Is there any significance to the off diagonals or being positive? Like, is it uh, a natural class? Mm. Uh, so, and let me just think about some actual case for a second. Uh, I guess not. Not immediately obvious to me. It's sort of, well, actually, yes, it is. It is. If you have all positive, then you get this interesting thing where I think the subset probabilities sort of iteratively increase. Do you? in some way because you're determinant all your sort of permutations of sort of order of whatever you're doing all become like the same sign because all cycles of length k in your associated graph are all now the same sign if you look at the product of 
if you associate with an edge the sign of the off diagonal entries in the symmetric case, then this is saying something about these cycles. And so when you look at like the uh, class expansion determinant, this should tell you something. Yeah. Uh, any more? All right, thanks, John. <laughs>